Well, good day, folks, and welcome to this special edition of the Conditional Release Program. I'm Jack the Insider. Joel's not joining me today because I'm going to do a one-off special on the life and crimes of Roger Caleb Rogerson. The 83-year-old, as we all know, serving a life sentence for the murder of Jamie Gow, suffered a brain aneurysm on Thursday, <clears throat> the 18th of January 2024, and was transferred from Long Bay Prison to the Prince of Wales Hospital at Randwick, where he died at 11.15pm on Sunday. I know one of the, I'll say, medical staff at Prince of Wales, a rather lovely woman who has saved many lives in her time, and she's also had the experience of tending to some of the most dangerous people in custody, transferred from Long Bay Jail, uh, just drop kick up the road to Randwick where uh, she has had to basically cater for end-of-life treatment for people like Rogerson, Nettie Smith. Uh, imagine becoming a doctor and having to deal with those and following all the, the, uh, the details of the Hippocratic Oath. She's a person not... Not interested in crime at all, but uh, she's had the, uh, I guess we could call it a distinction of, uh, of, of uh, tending to some of uh, the worst people in New South Wales as they end, as they come to the end of their life, essentially in custody. Roger Rogerson is, I, I met the man on a number of occasions socially had a few beers with the Dodger on two occasions. I interviewed him on four occasions. I'll get to the sort of personality stuff towards the end of the program, but he was a fascinating character and a bundle of, shall we say, personality disorders that he concealed very, very well. I note the term psychopath has been used around Rogerson's life. It may be true. I'm not in a position to diagnose, but he was overtly a very charming fellow <clears throat> and uh, and he'd tell his funny cop stories and you'd laugh out loud and, and every now and then you'd just get a little bit of a sign of the real Roger Rogerson. He had, was described as piercing blue eyes. I don't know that I would call them that. By the time I got to know him and by that stage he was in, the, in his 60s, I would describe those eyes as essentially dead. A bit of a sparkle about them, yes, but when those little moments of disclosure of the of the of the real Roger Rogerson came, there was this sort of dead-eyed stare to him, which was quite frightening. He is, and I mentioned this on our true crime episodes previously. He is the the most frightening fellow I met because he had no compunction. And um, he was extremely dangerous. Of course, he was serving a life sentence with his associate over the murder of Jamie Gow, but he had spent two other stretches in jail. In 1995, he was released from his first uh, sentence after serving more than three years for per perverting the course of justice. The conviction was over money deposited by him into a bank account under a false name, or there were a number of bank accounts, actually. He was filmed on CCTV footage, banking cash under false names. It was this failure to recognise that cameras were sitting above him that would ultimately lead to his demise in the murder of uh, Jamie Gow. <laughs> and uh, he he appears even back in back in 1990 back in 1990 not to have been aware of cameras and that was perhaps his uh, his, his decline occurred in that way. So conviction for the per per perversion of course of justice in 1990 <clears throat> or offences in 1990 sentenced in 1992. He was rather upbeat about his time in prison and. He wrote to a reporter uh, in the middle of his first stretch and he said there, he was actually uh, at the Barama Jail, HM Barama, which is 
no longer a jail for men. I believe uh, it's all closed now and it's a bit of a museum piece. It was built in the 19th century. But there he was in Berrima. Would have been nice and cold in the winter, but he seemed to be having a lovely time. There are about 16 ex-coppers here, he told the journalist, including former Deputy Commissioner Bill Allen, who was almost 71 years of age, and a nice old bloke, Rogerson said. So I have plenty of mates to talk to. I've been sitting here writing this letter as well as watching the first State of Origin match at Lang Park. Thank God the Blues won, the Dodger said. I bet a chocolate bar on them winning. Believe me, that's a big uh, big bet down here. So he's put a crunchy on the line and uh, and had a win <laughs> back in 1993. I, uh, I actually approached Rogerson. That's actually the last time I spoke to him. And this was around the time where... Mark Standen, who was a senior police officer in the New South Wales Crime Commission, was jailed for a long, long time, 18 years, I believe, over his role while he was uh, a member, senior member of the uh, New South Wales Crime Commission of uh, trafficking in precursor drugs. And I rang Rogerson because Standen had just been sentenced, as I say, to a very long stretch. And I asked Rogerson, tell me, what's it like for a police officer to go to jail for the first time? And his response was really odd. He, and this gets back to the personality stuff, he didn't have a lot of emotional connection with with the outside world. And so when I asked for an emotional response on how his first days in jail were, he didn't really have much to say. He mentioned that he was he was walked through a, a general prison population with only a chain link fence separating him and them and hearing and saying that he was telling me that he was spat upon by some of his fellow inmates. I'm not entirely sure that I believe that. And certainly his letter to a reporter in nineteen ninety three says that he was doing he was having rather lovely time in jail. When he was um placed on remand over the murder of Jamie Gow, I also know that he was seen as something of a celebrity prisoner, this time in Silverwater in uh, Sydney's West, and uh, which is the main, main remand facility in New South Wales. Um, and he, he, uh, he was signing autographs in there for, for young up-and-coming crooks who thought uh, Rogerson was a bit special. So there's no sort of sign that he did any sort of hard time. And as I said, when I asked him for a sort of an emotional response, he couldn't give it. And I I suspect there's two reasons for that. One, he didn't do very hard time on the first two occasions. We'll get to the second one in a minute. And the other point being that he really had, he really did struggle when you asked him closely how he felt about things. He really struggled to to basically alliterate this and then spell it out. In 2005, he and his wife, Anne Malocco, were convicted of lying to the Police Integrity Commission. They'd done that way back six years earlier. And he was given a 12-month sentence at Kirkconnell Correctional Centre, two-and-a-half-year sentence, and his wife was sentenced to periodic detention for two years for the same offence. This is in regard to a scaffolding business that Rogerson was running, and providing bribes and uh, financial incentives to uh, council officers on building sites in, in local councils in the west of Sydney. And, and, and he was paying bribes, not receiving them. He was paying bribes in order to get work and, and, uh, and in order to uh, explain that away. He lied to the Police Integrity Commission and that led well that that came from actually an appearance in the ICAC and and he was sentenced again on this occasion uh he came out of jail at Kirkconnell with a stretch limo picking him up at the at the gates and heading off for a bit of partying and not long after that of course Rogerson joined up with Chopper Reed and Mark Jacko Jackson to do was only described as some of, can only be described as some of the worst cabaret you've ever seen. They were really appalling. It was a mix of terrible stand-up jokes. It was called known as known as the good, the bad, and the ugly tour. And I guess uh, Roger Roger was the good, <laughs> Chopper was the bad, and Jacko was the was the ugly. 
I think you could probably put Rogers in in the other two categories quite comfortably. Just a just a, a brief word about Anne Malocco. She she was Rogerson's second wife. His previous wife had left him with her daughters after learning a lot of the um, misbehaviour that Rogerson was up to, and uh, he was estranged from his daughters for a very long time. I don't know if they ever reconciled, but I do know that Anne Malocco, his second wife, uh, was sort of leading the response to media inquiries. It leads to the prospect of a Rogerson funeral. And as I quipped on uh, Twitter or X, Rogerson was, and as I quipped on Twitter or X, I gather the funeral will be a fairly quiet affair. There won't be a lot of people mourning the loss of Roger Rogerson. And uh, I suspect the the funeral will, will be a quiet affair, a small affair, and as I quipped on Twitter, at least his wife can save a few bob on the catering. A cheese sandwich and a can of Coke should do it. It does lead to a discussion about why Rogerson was admired by so many. And I did sort of come across a few Twitter responders uh, hitting me up about the death of Rogerson, who took this sort of long-standing view that, that Rogerson was a person or as a police officer, was dedicated to keeping bad people off the streets and that in order to do so, he had to get a bit down and dirty. That's the that's the general theme of it. It's absolute nonsense, of course, because Rogerson wasn't just keeping an eye on other crims and prepared to get a bit down and dirty to make a few convictions. He was actively engaged in all manner of criminal offences that include heroin trafficking and what will lead on to murders, definitely. But I also do want to raise the prospect that he was actually running a murder for hire business. And we'll get to that shortly. <clears throat> he had been acquitted when we go through his uh, line of, uh, of antecedents. He was acquitted of the attempt to bribe New South Wales Police Detective Mick Drury. He was acquitted on the charge was that he had offered Mick Drury a bribe of $40,000 to change his evidence in a heroin trafficking trial of Roger. He was acquitted of offering Mick Drury a bribe of $40,000. The bribe, allegedly, uh, was to... For, for Mick Drury to change his evidence in the trial of a Melbourne-based drug drug supplier by the name of Alan Williams, sometimes called the Cowboy. Alan Williams had proposed that he could not return to jail over this. Mick Drury had already given evidence under oath at Williams' committal hearing, and uh, uh, then uh, Rogerson had asked him, that's Mick Drury, to change his evidence in the subsequent trial. And certainly Mick Drury knocked back that advance. And only after Mick Drury was shot was, and that was on June 6, 1984, and recovered sufficiently to give police some information as to who he believed was involved in having him shot, the attempted murder on his life. Uh, that uh, Mick Drury announced that he had been approached by Rogerson with the offer of the bribe. Ultimately, he was acquitted of that, that Rogerson was acquitted of that charge, and subsequently he was charged with conspiracy to murder Mick Drury. As I say, June 6, 1984, Drury shot twice at his kitchen window in, uh, in the uh, upper north shore of Sydney. And... Uh, Two shots. I want people to remember this. There's two shots fired at the chest. Uh, the second round uh, hit Mick Drury after deflecting from uh, deflecting from the kitchen blind, and that's probably the only thing that saved his life. He was very seriously wounded and considered, uh, well, he was basically given his last rights, but he did recover. And, and as I said before, he first disclosed the, the offer of the bribe from Rogerson. He was acquitted on that. Rogerson was acquitted on that and allowed to, allowed to, go, allowed to walk. 
and then he was subsequently acquitted of the conspiracy to murder McDrury. And in the trial, because the the bribe attempt had been had he'd been acquitted on that, it was determined by the judge that that information, that background information as to why Rogerson was involved in the murder of McDrury, was never presented to a jury, and uh, Rogerson walked away. But what we do know about that trial is that Alan Williams, a drug supplier from Melbourne, had pleaded guilty to conspiring to murder Michael Drury with Christopher Dale Flannery and Roger Caleb Rogerson, and he received a 10-year jail sentence. He died in jail, Alan Williams. He died in jail from what a lot of drug intravenous drug users died from, liver complications, liver cancer. <coughs> But Williams, as I said, had pleaded guilty to conspiring to murder Mick Drury, Christ- Christopher Dale Flannery, and Roger Caleb Rogerson. When it came term, it came time for Rogerson to uh, face a jury over that conspiracy to murder charge. He was acquitted largely because the jury was not presented with the evidence of his offer of the bribe. <sighs> So he managed to walk away and probably what was the most serious charge that he would face at least until he was tried for the murder of Jamie Gale. So why the intrigue about Roger Rogerson? I mean, why does he sort of capture our imagination a fair bit? I guess the the first answer to that is Blue Murder, where he was magnificently played by Richard Roxburgh. And when I spoke to Rogerson about about, uh, Roxburgh's portrayal, he actually nodded and thought it was quite good. On other occasions, he said, I should have sued them. I should have made millions from them. They lied about me, and he was quite angry about it. But when I spoke to him about Roxburgh's portrayal, he said he said he was quite impressed by it, but Roxburgh, was, as Rogerson, was constantly smoking in Blue Murder, and Rogerson said with a shake of his head, I never smoked a cigarette in my life. So he wasn't concerned about being portrayed as a drug trafficker, as a heroin trafficker, as a person who profited from robberies, violent situations and murders, he was more worried about being portrayed as a smoker. Very, very strange. Very, very strange. But when we get to this, why the persona? I mean, there are a, there's a long and illustrious, well, a long and disgraceful history of uh, New South Wales police officers gone rogue. Probably the worst was was a police detective by the name of Fred Cray. Cray famously was involved in the arrest of Ryan, Ronald Ryan and Peter Walker in Sydney at the Concord Hospital, where they were arrested without incident. Ryan would Ryan and Walker would be returned to Victoria, where um, where Ronald Ryan would ultimately hang for the murder of. Of a, of, a, of a correctional services officer and Walker would receive a, a life sentence. But for all, all Cray did was arrest Walker. He was sitting in the car, just popped up alongside the car, pulled a shotgun and stuck it in Walker's face, said, don't, don't move. I guarantee you, if you were in Walker's position there, you wouldn't want to move because one move the wrong way and he would have been shot dead. Now, Cray was as bent as all get up. As a copper, he um, uh, he led what was called the toe cutter gang, and it's really infamous stuff. Where they would, they were ex- actually a sort of group of merchant seamen, uh, their leader from Ireland, and these guys would, under Cray's instruction, get around and uh, abduct men that were known to have committed armed robberies in the in the previous day or so, and then abduct them take them away to some quiet place and torture them before they handed over the money. Known as the Toe Cutter Gang, obviously using the pliers, whip off a few uh, pinky toes, etc. But also they uh, they tortured people with blow torches and all sorts of things. It was rather horrific. Uh, on one occasion, I know that the, uh, uh, the, the Toe Cutter Gang removed a tattoo of a fellow and put it in the mail to his wife. And the the man, of course, didn't just have his tattoo removed and a piece of skin with it. He was killed by the Tokata gang. And Cray got around. He would basically be the the eyes and ears for the Tokata gang. So whenever there was a robbery, a significant payroll heist, 
for example, he um, he would instruct the toe cutter gang to go and do the collections, to go and grab the guys, to get them in. I recall the evidence given by a former painter and docker who was actually charged and jailed, so convicted and jailed over a, a, an armed robbery of a um, of an armor guard uh, van. It was at the time, in the early 70s, it was the record for a an armed robbery, the record haul. They, they dragged in several hundred thousand dollars and they immediately felt the wrath of Fred Cray and the toe cutters. And uh, and this particular fellow was was taken taken to a place, and uh, he was about to be tortured. But he decided he decided he'd basically give his mates up. He did. He, he said the coronial. This was at the coronial inquest of Flannery's disappearance. He said uh, to to the coroner's court. He said once they nipped off a pinky toe, they weren't just going to stop there. So he decided to get in early, give 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 his mates up, and give the dough up. Ultimately, they were charged. That was the other side of it. Then Cray had come along and arrest them, and they'd go to jail for very long periods of time. Cray was kicked out of the force. Very similar sort of trajectory, career trajectory to that of Rogerson. Cray was kicked out of the force in the early 1970s and then became a licensed private detective, a terrifying human being. Um, and he was involved in the Nugent Hand Bank. He is was, he's long gone, uh, was was or should be considered a person of interest, a significant person of interest uh, in, in regard to the assassination killing of, um, he should be considered as a significant person of interest in relation to the assassination style killing of Don McKay, a local politician and a furniture store salesman who was uh, providing information to police about the Green Castles. The Calabria Mafia, Mafia's activities with Aussie Bob Trimboli to grow, cultivate, and move around large amounts of marijuana, and believed that Mackay was killed at the behest of these people, this Calabrian group, and Fred Cray would easily have been been could easily have been approached to do that murder. It's speculation, but it's sort of educated speculation, if you know what I mean. He was involved, as I say, with with the Nugent Hand business, and he was also running around in central New South Wales in relation to all of that. And uh, so he was never very far away from Griffith at any at any given time. Fred Cray ultimately died of cancer. He was a terrible human being. There is a recording of him approaching a prostitute. And uh, he and he says to this prostitute, who he actually had had an affair with, he said, "Now you, where, where, if you see anyone out and about with a lot of money, uh, we give them one day. We give them one day." So he's talking about armed robbers splurging their cash, drinks, and and uh, and colluding with prostitutes in celebratory ways after their after their haul, and. Cray said to uh, said to this prostitute, "If you if you see these guys running around with a lot of money, you give them you give me a call." He said, "We give them one day, and then we we'll pay them a visit." That's the toe cutter gang. We, then we, we then we pay them a visit, and he said, and they and they'll say, "We'll give you half, but we don't want half. We want the lot." And that's how that's how it worked. I mean, uh, this was the this was the environment that Rogerson grew up in. He was mentored by another significant and notorious New South Wales police detective by the name of Ray Garrett Kelly. And we talked about the arrest before of of, of Ryan and Walker at Concord. Um, <coughs> Kelly led the way, led, led that 50 or 60 odd police officers who made those two arrests and became absolutely famous in New South Wales circles at least as this police officer who could get anything done. But Kelly was notoriously corrupt and he was involved in offering, probably the first one to offer criminals the green light. And he offered the green light to one Leonard Arthur McPherson who had provided the information that led to the arrest of Ryan and Walker, which made 
Ray Kelly, already famous in New South Wales crime circles, uh, it made him a nationwide figure. Almost when you look at the reports from that period around the arrest of Ryan and Walker, it, it sort of puts Kelly, casts him in this role of almost a sort of super a superhuman crime fighter, this almost cartoon-type figure. Journalists were in awe of him. The journalism around crime at the time, and we're talking now the 1960s, early 70s, the journalism was terrible. Most of it didn't investigate what was really going on and simply relied on people like Kelly and Cray and Rogerson and others to tell them what had happened. And so that's what that's what we got this very significant us and them thing. The culture of the New South Wales Police Force that Rogerson came into was one that really concerned crooks from other parts of the country. I I once uh, I spoke with a Billy the Texan Longley. Uh, the Texan had uh, was a was a painter and docker. He was a violent human being. He was convicted of uh, of murder and spent a lot of time in jail, and 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 he was ultimately the one who kicked off the Royal Commission into the Federated Ship Painters and Dockers Federation. I think that's what the, uh, the Painters and Dockers, anyway, which became a huge Royal Commission. But his letters to the Bulletin, that's Billy Longley's letters to the Bulletin, kicked off that inquiry, and Bill Longley now released from jail and, and in his dotage, I said, I asked him, I said, what's the difference between the crime scene in Victoria or in Melbourne and, and, in, and, and in Sydney? What's, what's the difference there? And he looked at me and said, mate, he said, down here in Melbourne, down here, it's us, the crooks, and them, the cops. But in New South Wales and Sydney, he said, you wouldn't know the difference. And that's about right. He understood, like many Melbourne crooks did, that that crims up in Sydney would be in the service more often than not, would be in the service of and providing inf- information, being fizz gigs, as the crooks say, to, to police officers like Kelly, like Cray, like Rogerson, providing information to keep themselves out of jail. McPherson was a great fizz gig for uh, for Kelly and later Rogerson throughout his life, and and he would often inform strategically on his rivals, have them removed, have them sent off to jail, and uh, it, as I say, it got to the point where uh, he provided ostensibly the escalation of the rapid escalation of of Ray Kelly's uh, reputation as a formidable crime fighter by providing him information on the whereabouts of. Ron Ryan or Peter Walker, he was given the green light and free to go around and commit whatever murders he liked, and he did. There's a long stream of unsolved murders uh, in the 1960s that were essentially rivals of McPherson's who were removed, and McPherson, with the green light, could commit these murders with impunity. And so when I first interviewed Rogerson, he talked about the time that he was he was investigating the murder as a very young police officer. I think he joined the, the New South Wales Police Force in 1958, became a cadet not long after. But in 1962, he was a junior officer with Ray Kelly investigating the murder of Robert Pretty Boy Walker, who was almost certainly killed by Len McPherson, with Stan Smith driving the car, while on the day... In fact, where Len McPherson was getting married for the second time, and uh, they heard of the whereabouts of Robert Pretty Boy Walker, who had shot at Smith. In fact, wounded Smith earlier in the week, and they uh, didn't let the business of uh, McPherson's wedding get in the way. McPherson and Smith rapidly left the wedding after the service. They went to uh, an address in 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 East. East Sydney, where they changed clothes, and then they hunted down Walker. They were told he was in a, a motel in Randwick. He wasn't. So they drove around for a bit, and then they came across him, and it's believed McPherson hit him with machine gun fire. Walker Walker received multiple gunshot wounds. And then uh, McPherson and the extraordinary Stan Stoner Smith drove back to Kingsford, got changed again, and went back to the wedding just in time 
just in time for the speeches. Perfect alibi, of course, because no one's going to really know that they were missing and they're not going to say that anyway. So perfect way for, for, for McPherson to provide an alibi. But <clears throat> And later on, of course, that was a 1962 murder. And later on, later on, of course, McPherson could kill with impunity, with the green light, as a result of the arrest of, um, of Ryan and Walker in 1966. So this is the environment Rogerson is working in. He understands the nature of corruption. He understands that New South Wales policing, very different to Victoria policing, where it was actively encouraged for people like Rogerson to have relationships with criminals in order to, I mean, basically, face value, you know, you know this is going to lead to corruption, but the the encouragement was put there because because was said that you would get better information that way. But, of course, it did lead to sort of manic corruption. But, well, it's best sort of described with Rogerson, you know, sort of hanging out with Nettie Smith and Graham Henry and setting them up as armed robbers, heroin traffickers, and uh, and copying a, a cut of their profits. So Rogerson was very much a creature of his, of his environment, but he ratcheted up police corruption to untold level, levels. And... Uh, <coughs> He had these associations with criminals like Nettie Smith, like Christopher Dale Flannery, and we'll get into that in a little while. Flannery arrived in Sydney in 1983. He had just been acquitted of the murder of a businessman by the name of Roger Wilson. It was a long, long trial. And one of the people giving Crown evidence against him a prostitute by the name of Deborah Boundy and an associate of Flannery's co-accused, Kevin Weary Williams. Uh, Deborah Boundy disappeared and remains on Victoria Victoria Police's missing persons list. Never uh, her body never found. And the rumor amongst the criminal underworld is that the killer was a very young <coughs> Gangitano, Alphonse Gangitano who would have been, I think, about 19 at the time. And the word is that Gangitano gave Deborah Bounty a hot shot of heroin and her body was disposed of. Without that crown evidence from Bounty, who had had conversations with Kevin Williams indicating what uh, had uh, had occurred, that Wilson was pulled over on the old Mulgrave Freeway by Chris Flannery and Alan Williams, sorry, not Alan Williams, we- Kevin Weary Williams, and... They posed as police officers. They abducted him and took him to a quiet spot where he was shot dead and buried. Flannery was acquitted of that trial and he came down the steps of the Supreme Court feeling rather jubilant. He was arrested there and then by one of Rogerson's associates, albeit a homicide detective, by the name of Bill Duff. And Duff and Victorian police assisted in the um, extradition of Chris Flannery to Sydney. And despite being charged with murder, Flannery was bailed, which is a pretty rare event. It also speaks to the weakness of the case. He was charged with the murder of a Sydney-based crook who'd been running around in Melbourne up to no good. I've talked about him on the conditional release program a bit. His name is uh, Ray Loxley. I think he was 25 when he was murdered, known as the Lizard. It may well have been a police killing, uh, his body was found in Menai in Sydney's west with uh, several shots to the chest. Uh, Flannery was charged with the murder, but there was very, very little in terms of evidence uh, that would have stood up in court. And uh, Flannery arrived in Sydney under charge of murder, bailed, and then was running around with Rogerson meeting the uh, the criminal networks in in, in Sydney. McPherson talks about his first meeting with Flannery and he said, when I saw him, Flannery, who was a good style of bloke, if you if you know what I mean, he, he had worked in the menswear section of the uh, Perth David Jones store. He was actually quite dapper, dressed well. And uh, when McPherson first met him, he goes, God, when I, first, when I first met the bloke, I thought he was a fucking real estate agent. He did look a little bit like that. He did look a little bit harmless, Chris, until you saw the until you saw the temper explode and then there was then there were problems. Chris, of course, was known as Redicule. He had a reputation by the time he got to Sydney through the murder of, of, of Roger Wilson and uh, the charge of 
murdering Ray Loxley, which he probably, which he almost certainly didn't do, came to Sydney with a reputation of rent a kill, Mister Rent a Kill, and he arrived in 1983. He became a bodyguard for Graham, uh, sorry, for George David Freeman, the eminent crook and gambling professor. Made a lot of money for McPherson and Stan Smith and other members of the team. And uh, he was basically putting the shingle out as a hitman. We'll get to all of that in a little while because there is some speculation. I want to talk about Rogers and what he was really up to in the 80s. And, and I've run that past some of the people who knew him very, very well, his biographer, Duncan McNabb. And we're going to talk about that was all about. And it's kind of one of those can't see the forest for the trees moments around what Rogerson was up to. <clears throat> but things had already be- – it was the beginning of the end for Rogerson was the the shooting and killing of Warren Lanfranchi. <clears throat> and that was kind of the beginning of the end for him. Now, it was a really interesting case Lanfranchi was a career criminal, a very violent man. And, of course, he had a relationship with the prostitute, Sally Ann Huckstep. And, uh, and he was led to the scene in Danga Place in Chippendale in, 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 in the Sydney city, just outside the Sydney city, uh, where he was shot twice by Roger Rogerson. He, he uh, attended the meeting with, I believe, $20,000 in cash, which was designed to bribe Rogerson and others to get police off his back. Lanfranchi had waved a gun and, in fact, fired shots at a traffic police officer who pulled the car over he was being driven in and the the motorcycle cop let them go because uh, Lanfranchi was firing shots at him through the window of the car in the back seat. That sort of behaviour would get you killed. Would would get you killed in 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 a New South Wales police framework. And so Lanfranchi thought he was going to be killed. He attended the scene with 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 the bribe money for Rogerson, and was shot dead. Now that matter was subsequently examined by the coroner, who ultimately found that Rogerson had acted in the line of duty, and no charges were laid. But by this stage. Everyone had had a good look at Roger Rogerson, including some of his police associates. So when Lanfranchi was was shot dead, it was was done in front of uh, probably twelve, maybe as many as twenty police officers who saw what had happened. They were hiding in cars and in, in a pub across the road, and and uh, and they would have seen what had happened. They would have thought in the culture of the time that Lanfranchi was fair game because he had fired shots at a police officer. But they would also have seen Rogerson shoot uh, Lanfranchi in the chest, two shots, one in, the, one in the chest. There were a number of ear witnesses. I use that term a bit loosely, but there were people who heard a shot ring out and then nine seconds later, another shot ring out. And that is indicative of a sort of coup de grace type killing, but it's also two shots in the chest. And I want you to remember, two shots in the chest. It was the beginning of the end because Sally Ann Huckstep had, was making a lot of noise about what she believed was the murder of Lanfranchi, and almost certainly was. And uh, she, made, uh, she kicked up a, a fuss at the coronial inquest. She was, uh, was going on uh, national current affairs programs and telling her side of the story, indicating that Rogerson was this corrupt, venal officer that no one had thought of before. I mean, we have to remember he was the recipient of the Peter Mitchell Award. It's the highest honour a police officer can receive. He was the most decorated, I believe still is, the most decorated police officer in New South Wales. So he was seen as this kind of almost, you know, son of Ray Kelly type figure, this sort of superhuman crime fighter until the murder, or the, yeah, the murder, let's call it that, the murder of Warren, Warren Lanfranchi in Danga Place in 1981. That was the beginning of the end. Earlier, of course, Rogerson had shot dead a bank robber by the name of Philip Weston. That took place in 1976. And, uh, and he also killed in the line of duty 
a bank robber by the name of Butchie Burns in 1977. That scene is portrayed in Blue Murder with Rogerson coming across the vehicle where three armed robbers, including Butchie Burns, were in the car and firing shots directly into the vehicle and Burns being killed at that point. It didn't quite go down like that. There were Rogerson and there were a lot of police there that day and uh, Burns and his uh, associates were going to rob a bank just across the street when they were shot, when they were set upon by, by Rogerson and others. But there were, there were two police officers firing uh, rounds into that car from shotguns, and uh, one of them was Roger Rogerson, of course, and the other one was Arnie Tease. And one of my, who was a sort of celebrated, if somewhat colourful character in, in, in Sydney policing <laughs> lexicon, he ended up becoming a barrister, re- retired from the New South Wales Police Force. He's long, long dead now. But Tease had a bit of a stench about him too. Anyway, the two men, Rogerson and Tease, fired rounds into the vehicle, killing Butchie Burns. And uh, as the other police came forward to sort of mop up their operation, Tease and Rogerson had this stand-up argument over who had killed Burns. I shot him. No, 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 I did. And uh, this was because they wanted the medal for it, for the, the bravery medal. It was something that both men hankered for. So by the time we get to 1981, Rogerson's already killed two people that we know of in the line of duty and received medals for it. And then we get to Lanfranchi and we must describe as the, the beginning of the end. This is 1981. Rogerson had carefully nurtured criminal associates. The team we talked about, Len McPherson, Stan Smith, George Freeman, and he'd picked up a young, ambitious crook by the name of Ned Smith, or Arthur Stanley, Nettie Smith, and his associate, Graham Henry. They used to knock around with Lanfranchi, and, of course, Nettie Smith escorted Lanfranchi to Danga Place where he left the scene just after Lanfranchi was shot dead. And Henry and Smith, that's Nettie Smith, were involved in armed robberies, often with police collusion and assistance for their cut. And they were huge heroin dealers at the time. And, uh, and, and Rogerson was living off, essentially, off those profits. He had other associates, and these are less well-known. that include the most notorious figure in Melbourne by the name of Dennis Allen, one of the, well, in fact, the oldest son of the Pettingill clan, known as Mr. Death, for his penchant to inv- of inviting people over to his house in Stevenson Street, Richmond, now called rather lovely, uh, rather lovely fashion, Cremorne. But uh, it was uh, all sort of working man's cottages in those days. Dennis Allen would invite people over, and if they upset him at some point, Along the way, he'd shoot them dead in his own home and dispose of the bodies, often popping them in uh, 44-gallon drums, filling them up with concrete or just chopping them up and taking them down to the arrow nearby. We know that uh, Dennis Allen and and, uh, Rogerson were close. We know that Rogerson was moving heroin, uh, that he, as I understand it, was pinching from from evidence lockers in Sydney Police, around Sydney, the old Sydney Central Police Station. And then he would, with the assistance of a courier, someone close to Dennis Allen, provide uh, ship that heroin down to Melbourne. This became, the relationship between Rogerson and, and, and Dennis Allen became a whole lot clearer after the shooting and the attempt murder of Mick Drury. And, and that may as well lead us to this, because if, if we look at Lanfranchi as the beginning of the end, the attempt murder of Mick Drury was, in 1984, three years later, was considered beyond the pale by everyone in the New South Wales Police Force and the end of Rogerson's career as a police officer, ultimately in 1986. We know, as I said before, that Alan Williams was being charged with a matter basically a heroin supply charge in Melbourne. Mick Drury was, was the senior officer. He had been the undercover officer who had, who had done the deal with uh, Williams and an associate of Williams. And uh, 
and Williams was charged with supply heroin and he would have gone to jail for a, cons- a considerable period of time. In the end, there were a number of murders around around this issue. We know that Mick Drury was offered the bribe and knocked it back and then we know also that he was shot twice in his home, in his kitchen, and, and ultimately survived very serious wounded. But there was a person who had also been involved. It was actually William's associate. His name was Robert Jumping Jack Richardson. And he was murdered in 1984, not long after the attempt murder of Mick Drury. His body was found in central Victorian bushland there. He'd been shot twice. Again, two shots. I'm not suggesting this time that Rogerson was the killer, but certainly he would have had advanced knowledge that Richardson was murdered and it's believed that Richardson was murdered in order not to provide evidence against Alan Williams. Um, So that's one killing, remains unsolved. A million-dollar reward was recently announced for information that would lead to any person suspected of the killing or the conspiracy to murder uh, Robert uh, Jumping Jack Richardson. And it leads us to a broader discussion about Rog- what Rogerson was up to. And and my belief is that Rogerson, in the mid-80s, was running a murder-for-hire business. And that's why he acquired the services of Chris Flannery, not just because Chris would go and commit murders on his behalf or at his instruction, but because Flannery was a very useful person to have. He had this reputation. He turned up on television, Flannery, with this, with this ferocious reputation as as a hitman uh, and so Rogerson would keep him around because he was very useful Rogerson was free to go and commit murders and what better person to use as a false suspect than Chris Flannery Chris may have committed a number of murders at the instruction of Roger Rogerson or it may in fact have been Roger Rogerson who was committing some of those murders not all of them perhaps but some of those murders and using Flannery as a kind of dupe. I've spoken with Duncan McNabb, a very good friend of mine, Duncan, and a former New South Wales police officer and very successful writer, and he has written a sort of seminal biography on on Rogerson's life. I think it's just called Rogerson, and I recommend it to anyone who wants to read more. I asked McNabb what he thought of this, and he said it was quite likely that that Rogerson was running a murder-for-hire business. There were a number of murders that I believe either Flannery did or Rog- or, or Rogerson very carefully placed Flannery in the position of being the prime suspect. There was there was a dual murder again unsolved of um, a, a painter and doc turned drug dealer who was living in Mwilumba with his wife. That's Terence Basham and Sue Smith and Flannery is likely to have committed that murder. He went to the home, Woolen Bar property. He is believed to have shot both uh, Sue Smith, the wife, and 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 her husband, Terence Basham, dead. There was a two year I think I think she was two. She might have even been a little bit younger than that. They had a daughter and the daughter was basically in the cot. And the baby was left unharmed with the mother and father bleeding out on the floor nearby, and a phone call was made to Sue Smith's uh, grandfather who travelled down to Brisbane and I think about 48 hours after the murder tended to the child who's alive and I believe living in in London, orphaned at way too early an an age. Basham had been part of a drug network. He decided to go his own way and, and he was killed by way of contract killing. Now, the suggestion is that that's probably Chris Flannery's murder. Chris Flannery was dining at a Gold Coast restaurant that day with his wife and a number of other associates. Rogerson wasn't there. I actually went and checked this, but Rogerson wasn't there, I believe, at the dining table. Flannery made his excuses over lunch and jumped in the car, drove to Mullen Bar, and then drove back to the Gold Coast. The time frame fits. Drove back to the Gold Coast restaurant, signed a credit card, as by, by way of payment, credit card docket by way of payment for the lunch, and that offered him an alibi. I believe that that murder was organised through Rogerson and, and committed by 
and committed by Flannery. As to the attempted murder of Mick Drury, with those two shots again, and I'll, perhaps it's time that I explain that, was police training at the time, firearms training, and Rogerson had worked in special forces. He had worked in the pre- predecessor of the tactical response group. So he had a high level of weapons training. And the training at the time, and I don't know if this is still the case, but the training at the time was two shots in the chest. You fire once, then you fire again, and that will stop and drop and generally kill anyone who's been killed, anyone anyone that they're, uh, that they're aiming their weapons at. So we have Mick Drury shot twice in the chest. It doesn't lead to a conclusion that uh, Rogerson was the ultimate shooter. It may well have been Flannery. Um, there was a piece of sort of nonsense evidence put about uh, that after the murder scene was scoured, a post in the laneway next to the house where the shooter had fired the shots from into Drury's body and through his kitchen window. There was someone had scraped the initials CDF into a post there and you think, well, it's not going to be Flannery. I mean, Flannery's not going to do that. But that's a rather obvious way of trying to put Flannery at the scene. At the same time, Rogerson has an alibi, which is pretty hard to to ignore. He was seen, and uh, there is bleary CCTV footage from the time, he was seen at the Scots Club in Arncliffe in Sydney that night. He got there a little bit after. Mick Drury was actually shot about six, I think about six p.m. on an evening, and 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 Rogerson was seen at the Scots Club about half an hour later. I've done the drive. Others have done the drive, and it's not likely that he could have done it in that time. So that probably means that Flannery was the killer. Unleashed an enormous reaction against Rogerson. People knew. Very senior police and very influential police understood that Rogerson was out of control, a complete rogue. And and so this is the beginning of the end for him. He was ultimately acquitted of conspiracy to murder, Mick Drury and, and, and the offer bribe. But by 1986, they'd had enough of Rogerson and he was removed from the force over a number of a number of misconduct charges that were ultimately found to be true. So he was kicked out in 1986. We probably should now move. I mean, Rogerson, as I said, spent a couple of, spent four years in jail from between 1990 and 2000 and f- 2006 and what he was doing in the meantime. And he was running around offering his services as a shooter. He was on a retainer for criminals in the cross, paid him from memory about $800 a week. God only knows you know, to do what. Be a bit of a Mr. Fixer. We also know that during the Melbourne underground, underworld uh, shootings, that, that Rogerson was ringing up Melbourne, you know, significant criminal figures in the Melbourne crime scene and offering his services as a hitman. And often they would reply, said, well, you're now in your 60s, Roger, and you've got a bit of a gammy knee and, you know, are you sure you can, you know, pull this off? You know, they're a bit sceptical. And Rogerson said, I can still shoot straight. And uh, so he put his, put the shingle out as a hitman through that period, uh, the sort of turn of the 21st century, if you like, beginning in the late 1990s with that sort of spree of, of, of underworld killings. We can't place him in any particular murder scene, but definitely we know that he was hanging the shingle out to go and commit a couple of murders. And he was running around. He was very, very close. And now we're getting closer to the present or closer to the time of the murder of Jamie Gow. We know that he had significant relationships with senior outlaw motorcycle gang figures. He was just—he was basically just running around doing whatever, whatever would make him a quid, and that, of course, leads us to the murder of Jamie Gow. Gow was not a clean skin. It has to be said. 
<laughs> he um, he was working for um, he was working for Chinese crime gangs, and he decided he was going to go out on his own. He'd been involved in some very unpleasant stuff, abductions, torture of of the abductees, and uh, was not a very pleasant fellow as well. He's quite a young man, of course, but he was really starting to make a name for himself as a as a pretty vicious crook. But he'd probably committed the the <laughs> one of the one of the huge one of the huge offences for the Chinese crime gangs. He had lifted almost three kilograms of of methamphetamine uh, from from these from these gangs, and he was out running around as a freelancer trying to sell it. And that's when he came across McNamara, Rogerson's associate, and they McNamara and he had a number of deals, and then McNamara foolishly, there's no other way of putting this, decided to bring Rogerson in. And uh, what we know, of course, that the gal was murdered in 2016 at a storage facility west of Sydney, all covered by CCTV footage. We know also CCTV footage was that Rogerson was was running around in pubs uh, in the southwest of Sydney offering uh, meth, uh, uh, offering to sell this meth, the, the wholesale price. I'm going to talk about retail price because they're obviously inflated. But the wholesale price, what he would be expected to get, the wholesale price at the time for nearly three kilograms of, of meth, and I've done the maths on this, is about $700,000. So it's a significant amount of money that they could expect to make from murdering from murdering Jamie Gow. What Gow and McNamara were in the storage facility in the locked up room with the surfboard and the surfboard bag and Rogerson came in and not long afterwards we see CCTV footage of the two men, McNamara and Rogerson, lumbering to the vehicle with what appears to be a very heavy weight he was quite a big guy, Jamie Gow, a, a, a significant weight in this surfboard bag. Jamie Gow had been shot twice in the chest. Again, we go back to that police training. It's it's speculation. I mean, McNamara would have had similar training, perhaps not to the same degree, and it doesn't necessarily tell us who actually pulled the trigger. And in a sense, it doesn't matter because the two men, McNamara and Rogerson, were engaged in a joint criminal enterprise and that's what a jury found and that's what they were ultimately sentenced to death for. The cleanup of the murder scene was extraordinary. I mean, these were two relatively old men, uh, Rogerson now in his 70s, bad knee, as I said, by this stage a bad back. He sort of had this lumbering gait to him. He, he, he wasn't physically strong at all. And uh, McNamara was a bit paunchy and not his fittest either, and and having to lumber around what would have been eighty to ninety kilograms of of dead human was too much for them. And there is this extraordinary stuff where we see McNamara and Rogerson appear at a jetty uh, where they are preparing to put Gow on a boat and take him out past the heads through the Georges River and past the heads and dump the body there, which they ultimately did. But they couldn't get the body onto the boat. So after a bit of a struggle, they returned to their vehicle with <laughs> with Gow still in the back and went to Kennards and hired a block and tackle so they could get him get this body in the surfboard bag onto the boat and out past the heads and dispose of it. And I remember people asking me at the time, how could Rogerson be so dumb? I mean, this cunning, shrewd player for decades. How could he have been so stupid as to realise as not as to not realise that he was on CCTV footage? And the answer is he probably, in in a way, is that didn't understand technology all that well. But he must have known that at least they would be filmed at some point or another, lumbering around with 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 dead Jamie Gow in a, in a bag. And the answer probably is that, and this is this is this comes to testimony that McNamara offered at trial at the trial for the murder of, of Jamie Gow, said that uh, as they got past the heads, stopped the boat, and prepared to uh, put Gow in the water in the body bag, weighted down, and they let 
and they let the body go and and Rogerson, according to McNamara, turned to him and said, shit, I forgot to gut him. And that means cut cut with a knife, cut the chest, cut the chest open, and uh, and that would stop the release of gases post mortem, and the body was likely not to float. And they forgot, and the body was found two days later by a fishing trawler. The police were already onto them. They they were basically on the scene of the storage facility. They'd been watching Rogerson very very closely. They arrested McNamara. Within hours of the body being discovered, Rogerson said that he went on the run. He didn't really. He went to the Gold Coast where a boxer was holding a sort of major event. And after uh, after the murder, here's Roger, the, the eternal psychopath, setting up the card table at this uh, boxer's event and selling a bit of Roger Rogerson merch. That's who he was, you know. That, that, that tells me just exactly who he Commit a murder, 48 hours later, there he is, being this notorious, lovable character, knocking out a bit of gear on a card table with a few clowns that are hanging around. He then left the, the Gold Coast, made his way back to Sydney. By this stage, he was wanted and uh, he was arrested at his home, uh, but he knew he was hot at that stage. And he was still, I mean, there are recorded telephone conversations that, that, that show Rogerson, even though he knows he's about to be charged with murder, or very, very likely that he'd be charged with the murder of Jamie Gow, he, and, and, a, and a manhunt was, was organised to, to get him, he was still trying to finalise another criminal enterprise, a $15 million extortion attempt, on, on property developer Ron Medich, who was facing his own murder charge at the time. And that didn't get off the ground. But certainly Rogerson was trying. Medich was ultimately convicted of murder and is now serving a long jail sentence. But at the time, we had a record, a record of a conversation that Rogerson made to another man. It was a tape call. He said, you've seen all the stuff on the news and whatever. It's fucking dreadful. And that's, he was referring to the Jamie Gow business. Despite this, you know, despite all this, he just wanted to know if the if the extortion attempt on Medich was going to go ahead. So, never stop, never stop, Rogerson, never stop. One man, violent crime wave. But this was the end. Jamie, the Jamie Gow murder was the end. Both men, McNamara and Rogerson, tried to claim the other was responsible. McNamara said that Rogerson shot uh, Gow. Uh, Rogerson said it was McNamara. Two shots, as we say as I say, and uh, it didn't matter. They were both going down, joint criminal enterprise. They were both convicted of murder. They were both con- convicted of of drug supply, a lesser offence, and it didn't really matter. They were both sentenced to oh, minimum 20s, minimum 22, I think, 22 years. And for men of that age, that was going to be them dying in prison. McNamara's still alive, but Rogerson, as we know, has, has, has turned his toes up. He had been involved essentially in murder all his life, uh, whether he was a police officer killing people in the inverted commas line of duty or whether he was running around perhaps, perhaps as the shooter of, of Mick Drury, although unlikely. Uh, it would seem that he was involved in the murder of Fiona, uh, sorry, Sally, that's Fiona was, was her daughter, Sally Ann Huckstep, uh, and um, uh, he was never charged over that. Nettie Smith was charged over the murder of of Sally Ann Huckstep and acquitted at trial. It would seem to me, Rogerson had a pretty lousy alibi for that, but it would seem to me that Smith was the killer and the jury got it wrong. Smith was seen after Sally Ann's murder with scratches down his face, and uh, I believe that he was the one who murdered uh, Sally Ann Huckstep it must also be remembered, though, that Rogerson despised Huckstep because she had been the person who had led essentially to his downfall. And <clears throat> there, are, there, are, there are a string of other murders of which he must be a suspect for. I, I noticed the SMH ran, ran a piece where it looked at a number of shooting murders. There was the sex worker Lynn Woodward and... Certainly Duncan McNabb believes that Rogerson was involved. Again, may not have been the shooter, but knew of the murder beforehand. 
<coughs> and Lynn Woodward was an associate of Warren, Warren Lamb Francis. <coughs> he was never charged, of course. Luton Shoe was a heroin traffic a trafficker who was, uh, it was, his body was found in a shallow grave and near Waterfall in south, south of uh, Sydney. Rogerson through McNamara had claimed responsibility for it, but I believe that was a Nettie Smith one. Luton Shoe was ultimately no build. Smith was initially charged for the murder of Luton Shoe, but it was no build after he was found guilty of the murder of Harvey Jones and, and the other murders, including the other murder charges, including that of uh, Sally Ann Huckstep, were not pursued with great vigour um, because Smith was sentenced to be never to be released to his conviction for the murder of Harvey Jones. We've spoken about jumping Jack Richardson. Again, I, I doubt that Rogerson was the shooter, but he would have had... It, it's very likely that he had prior knowledge of the shooting. Uh, the great mystery, of course, is the disappearance of... Chris Flannery himself, who disappeared in May. He'd been at the Connaught Apartments in Liverpool Street uh, near the CBD. He had been on the run, essentially. His wife, uh, Kath, and their two children were in the, were in the apartment. And, and, and Chris, who uh, was being hunted down by a range of, range of crooks and cops, was spending basically each night in a different place. He wasn't staying with the Connaught with them, but he and Kath had an arrangement that he would ring every three hours, and uh, and he did. On the day of his disappearance, he, he he went to the Connaught. He went downstairs to pick up his Ford LTD and couldn't start it, and that's where the sort of mystery ends. He was last seen on Liverpool Street. Blue Murder has him getting into the into a, a police car. We don't see who's driving it and we don't see the faces of the men who shoot him. I have an alternate theory that Flannery actually caught a taxi to the airport where he hired a car. That there, That is corroborated by the fact that a taxi driver and his coronial inquest provided evidence, at Flannery's coronial inquest, provided evidence that he took the ride and he saw Flannery with his little man bag, had a little man bag <clears throat> where he'd keep his gun, cash and credit cards and so forth. And uh, yeah, Flannery often did rent cars from the airport. I believe he did that day. He drove down to George Freeman's house in Yowie Bay, Sydney South. And he was, as I say, as I said very early in the program, he was a sort of bodyguard. And and we know that Freeman had had basically not texted him, but had contacted him by beeper, saying call Mercedes, and that was his nickname for Fre for Freeman. And the the story goes that Freeman said, I've got a gun. It was a sort of machine gun, automatic rifle. And that would basically he wanted Chris to come and have a look at it because he believed that this would solve all of Chris's problems. He would just basically Chris would have his have his automatic rifle and go around popping all uh, all his many enemies. The trouble is that Freeman was one of his many enemies but Chris didn't know this. So he went to, uh, Flannery went to Freeman's home uh, and he was taken downstairs where basically Freeman had his bar and his sort of business set up there and he was shot dead, not by Freeman, but by a gunman who came forward. There's a lot of speculation as to who that might have been. Um, one of the underbelly shows uh, showed uh, Len McPherson being the shooter. I have my doubts about that because McPherson was sort of a gibbering paranoid during this time. There were people being shot left, right and centre, known as the Sydney Gang Wars. And uh, I doubt that McPherson would have done it. It may well have been Rogerson and it may well have been Stan Smith. That's my best guess, that Stan Smith was the one who came forward and Stan was always the one that they'd, that they'd uh, use that the team would use, Freeman, McPherson and others, would uh, would use because he basically was was a cool hand. And and even if you're dealing with a very dangerous man, Flannery had a bullet wound in his uh, webbing of his thumb. He was using a lot of cocaine and he was dangerously out of control. So you would need someone with a very cool hand to dispose of him. My guess is Stan Smith and the body was wrapped up in carpet and taken out in the boat. Freeman lived on the waterside in the Georges River. 
took the boat out and uh, passed the heads and, and dumped the body. And unlike the Jamie Gathing, did it successfully. And finally, his body has never been found. Again, Rogerson may have been the shooter. He was certainly a person of interest, but he would have, if, if he wasn't the shooter, he would have had, again, knowledge in advance that this was going to happen. <coughs> Rogerson, according to McNamara, also boasted of killing Alan Williams, a cowboy. Uh, uh, that's unlikely. That is That seems to be hollow boasting because uh, Williams died of basically they claimed it was a sort of suicide, but he was very, very ill. <clears throat> and Rogerson told McNamara that it was made to look like suicide, but I doubt that that's the case. So a string of murders where he certainly had advanced knowledge where prior prior knowledge, as they say in the, the fine cotton thing, a lot of murders there. There's the there's the brothel madam in Perth, Shirley Finn, and that remains a great mystery as well. Nettie Smith was considered a person of interest, and if Smith was involved, then Rogerson would have been there in the background. A lot of murders, a lot of murders, and we're not going to really mourn Rogerson. We're going to th- we're really going to say, thank God he's gone, thank God he's gone, and thank God he died in jail. That's what he deserved with all of his crimes. I mean, if you were a parent in the 80s who had a child who overdosed in heroin, you could almost specifically blame uh, Rogerson and Nettie Smith and Graham Henry and, and others for the supply of heroin that had killed your, your daughter or your son. That's how lethal that business was. And then we get to the murders themselves. It's a good thing. I mean, in the end, the system won and, and Rogerson went to jail where he died. He might have died in a, in a secure ward in the Prince of Wales Hospital, but by that stage he didn't, he didn't know. He, his last days on this earth were, uh, were the sorts of punishment that he deserved and, and his reputation uh, in... Uh, in in the crime circles was well understood, even though Alan Jones famously said, oh, if we only had 100 Roger Rogersons, we wouldn't have all these problems. If we had 100 Roger Rogersons, my God, most of us would be murdered <laughs> and the rest of us would be on heroin. <laughs> if you had 100 Roger Rogersons running around, but part of that sort of nonsense that he was this sort of tough crime fighter, it was all rubbish. He was a straight-out psychopath. And I can tell you, just to, part, just, just to end this show, and I hope it's given you some sense of what he was about. Meeting him on one occasion with another journalist, and we were having a few beers. I just interviewed him, by the way, in a studio not far away. This is in a pub in Surrey Hills. And we're having a few beers, and and he's telling his funny stories, and he's being utterly charming, and it was hard not to laugh out loud, and it was hard not to like him. And then my journalist colleague Roger, he said, have you heard from Clive Small? Now, Clive Small was a very fine police officer in the New South Wales Police Service or Police Force. He, he was responsible for running the task force that led to the arrest and conviction of, of Malat, the uh, task force that led to the arrest and conviction of Glover, the granny killer. A- and he had been involved at very, very, the very pointy end of policing for a very long time, and understood and followed the the creed of protect and serve. He was a good copper, and Clive Small was the first police officer to investigate Roger Rogerson at any real level, particularly around his, um, particularly around the the attempt murder of Mick Drury. And so when this journalist colleague of mine said to Roger, have you heard from Clive Small? I suspect it was a question asked with a bit of mischief. And Rogerson, who'd been telling his funny stories and been witty and charming, just the mask slipped just for a moment and he said, I hope the cunt's got cancer. And those words just hung there and it was just, you looked into the eyes just for a moment and the mask had slipped and there was the psychopath. It was actually, it was not a moment, it was a jaw-dropping moment, most certainly, and was one where basically the words hung in the air and I thought to myself, oh, wow, you are a very dangerous human being. A psychopath? Probably. And no one will really mourn the passing of Roger Rogerson, with the possible exception of very close family. 
Uh, so I've sort of quipped in the past, Roger Rogerson's life is life and crimes. Uh, proof that not only does crime not pay, and I know that's a double negative, not only does, does, does crime not pay, but in the case of Roger Rogerson, you can save a few bob in the catering in his funeral. <laughs>